Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Marilyn Mackey, and I'm president of the League of Women Voters of Southeastern Connecticut. And tonight, we're very pleased to bring this forum to you on criminal justice system in Connecticut. And I'm now going to pass everything over to Judy Dalton, who is president of the League of Women Voters of Connecticut, my boss. <laughs> <laughs> and Judy will introduce our guests. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're happy to talk with you in person. We're happy to talk with you on public access television. And we'd love for you to uh, visit with us on YouTube. The League of Women Voters of Southeastern Connecticut welcomes you to a conversation about hyper-incarceration in the United States, and in Connecticut in particular. Our forum features, features two members of the writing committee that published a book that looks at how America came to have about 25% of the world's prison inmates and only 5% of the population. The book is The Justice Imperative, How Hyper-Incarceration Has Hijacked the American Dream. We'll be hearing about the book as we discuss this topic. Connecticut's 17 prisons house more than 16,500 inmates. Nearly 90% have drug and or alcohol addictions or mental health issues, and 47% are African American, versus 9% of the state's population is African American. Nationally, with the declared war on drugs, prison population between 1980 and 2000 skyrocketed from about 300,000 people to 2 million people. Two speakers who are with us today are from the Malta Justice Initiative, and we'll have them explain what that means. On my far right is John Santa, which I love his name. <laughs> Wanted to call him Mr. Claus, but I didn't. Is the founder of the Malta Prison Volunteers of Connecticut, known as the Malta Justice Initiative, with a mission to inform and educate the business, faith, and academic communities about opportunities available in criminal justice reform. Immediately to my right is our uh, surprise guest. His name is Brian Moran. And he happens to be the author of this particular book that we're talking about tonight. Uh, Mr. Moran is an attorney and has worked very hard with an editorial board to assure that this book contains strong facts and figures with lots of citations to indicate the depth of research that went into it. So with that, I'd like to begin with John Santa and ask him to give us a thumbnail description of the Malta Justice Initiative since he is the founder of that. So John? Judy, thank you very much. And we're very pleased and appreciative of the opportunity to be here with the League of Women Voters. And uh, thanks again. Uh, Malta, our, our efforts in Malta Justice Initiative began a number of years ago when a good friend of mine uh, went away to prison. And uh, I went to visit him there. And uh, he was an attorney, like Brian, as a matter of fact. And he was a very good person, and uh, he had done something wrong he shouldn't have done. He extorted some, I didn't extort, he, he, uh, he took some money from his clients, and off he went to prison for quite a while, at the age of 68. Well, when I went there, I found out that uh, we had a lot of people in prison. I had no idea. Back then, we had almost 20,000 people in our prisons. And we had 20 active prisons, and uh, I was in formation for a Roman Catholic group called the Order of Malta. It does work on behalf of the sick and the poor all throughout the world. And I said to myself, my goodness, look at this. We have 20,000 sick and poor people all co-located very conveniently by the governor. Isn't that nice? I'm going to come and see them. Because what I found was that, that neither church nor state was taking very good care of the people that were in prison. And that, then... Through that, we began to understand the magnitude of the issue, the size of the issue, and what was being done or not being done about it, which, quite honestly, is very little. Uh, Judy, this, this topic is one in which uh, Brian and I and our colleagues find ourselves in a sort of a, a prophetic mode, if you will. 
Now, prophets, uh, well, today they're all uh, uh, admired so much as wonderful people that do so much and all that business. The truth be known, they brought a message that people didn't want to hear. And generally, people don't want to hear that we are spending nearly a billion dollars in the state of Connecticut on prisons and incarceration. They generally do not want to hear that six out of ten of the people who go to prison are back in prison within three years. They generally don't want to hear that the simple maxim of tough on crime, lock them up and throw away the key, doesn't do anything, doesn't get us anywhere. As a matter of fact, it doesn't increase public safety, it decreases public safety. And we're going to get to some of those things. Sure. So how did you create the, this initiative? What did, what did you, how did you coalesce a group mm -hmm. to form this oh. initiative? That's a very good point. We, we began initially doing some very nice uh, 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 Christian work, trying to help people in prison and give them you know, doing Bible study and sacramental preparation and things of that nature, and that was fine. But then we realized that people needed jobs. Additionally, when they got out of prison, they needed a job. If they didn't get a job, they'd be back in prison pretty soon. So, yes, it was good to have some spiritual basis for their lives, but they also needed an economic basis for their lives. So we began working on that. And we also began to bring Bibles into prison, books into prison, and we also ran uh, some efforts for resettlement of people coming out of prison. But we were, we were working on this job thing. Uh, we called it the Prodigal Project, convincing employers to hire qualified ex-offenders. Well, we knew we had to go out and talk to people, so we did. And we went out and spoke to 45 different community groups, from New Rochelle to New London, uh, Rotary, Kiwanis, church groups, uh, uh, synagogues, all manner of people. And what we found was that the people that we met with, just average walking around citizens like like your like your members, the legal women voters, the viewers who are viewing us on YouTube or, or, or public access, they didn't know anything about it. They didn't know how big it was. They didn't know how much we were spending. They didn't know how bad the results were. And so therefore we we circumscribed a new mission for ourselves which was to educate and inform the public because we know that what we need to do is we need to express those informed opinions to our legislators because those are the ones that make the laws those are the ones that set the budget and until and unless we people and the members of the legal women voters are informed and rise up and say excuse me there's a better way to do this we're not going to get anywhere. So that's what brought us Thank you. And Brian, how did you get involved with all this? Well, um, I'm fairly recent uh, to the cause. Uh, I was actually recruited to be the editor of the book. Uh, the person who had the idea for the book approached me, knowing that I had written some business books. And so I had to be convinced to, to, to make the commitment of time uh, to the book. And it took me a while to come around to it. but I. The thing that I think uh, motivate, motivated me to do it was the year before I had been approached, I had writ, read a book called uh, The New Jim Crow by a woman called Michelle Alexander. She's a law professor at Ohio State. And the book speaks to the impact of mass incarceration on the inner city of population uh, in terms of perpetuating the cycle of dependence, the cycle of poverty, uh, and talk specifically about some of the collateral consequences that are faced by inmates and ex-offenders upon their release. Uh, such things as not being qualified for public housing, not being eligible for welfare, uh, not being able to get a driver's license, uh, not having, uh, therefore, a place to go to or a job to go to. So it's, it's little wonder why the recidivism rates in this country, the rates at which ex-offenders return to prison within a two or three year time uh, frame is so high uh, when you have these odds are kind of stacked against you. Um, you can imagine if you or I got released from prison, we had no place to go. We had no support, uh, both from the standpoint of you know, getting a job or getting a place to live, or even getting necessary treatment if we're dealing with a drug addiction uh, or, or a mental health, health issue. Yeah. 
Um, I dare say I don't think I would succeed. And in fact, at the end of the book, I concluded that uh, with those kinds of collateral consequences and odds stacked against one, you'd almost be better off leaving the country and going somewhere else and starting oh new, which is kind of a sad state of Certainly affairs. Is. So I was aware of that book. Um, and again, what was it called? The New Jim Crow. Um, it's the the uh, deals with the sort of uh, fact that we're we have a colorblind society, at least in principle, but when you look at the the practical implications of our prison uh, system and our criminal justice system, uh, she says it, it has the impact, the de facto like impact. Like those figures that of, uh, I brought up at the beginning. That, the that you saw in the, in the Deep South, the post uh, uh, Jim Crow. So um, it was a very impactful book. Um, and so I was interested in the subject, and it was a matter of committing the time uh, to get involved. At once well, I got in, <laughs> uh, it, it really, and, and I actually approached the book, uh, and we had a discussion with the writing committee around this, that we didn't want to um, make any recommendations that we thought would imperil the public safety. So that was kind of a starting premise. Uh, so we always had public safety kind of top of mind. And uh, it's amazing that when you get into it, it's somewhat counterintuitive, uh, but but with a reduced prison population, if you are able to reduce the prison population and reduce recidivism, you can actually drive uh, the crime rate lower. Um, so you can not only save money, but have lower crime. Yeah. So it seems like a no-brainer in a way, as far as I can see, that we should be doing some of this reform. But let me ask you a couple questions so we can make sure that we cover the scope of this study that you've done. Um, do you think it was the onslaught of drugs and the Rockefeller laws that escalated the expansion of Connecticut's prison population? And if so, tell us what that actually was and how it worked. Sure. Um, you know, I, I, I will acknowledge, and I, I don't think anybody would take issue with this, is we had a, a serious a crime problem in the United States in the 70s and the 1980s. <laughs> Uh, I, I went to the movies uh, yesterday and I saw the most violent year, which is a movie uh, set in New York City in 1981, which happened to be the highest crime rate in New York. And anybody who was around in those days can tell their own personal horror stories about what it was like to uh, walk around at late at night in uh, New York City or really any major metropolitan area in the country. Um, I mean, I, I was held up at night point at one point. Um, I think everybody has, probably has a similar story. We had with the combination of the, the drug epidemic, uh, epidemic uh, particularly cocaine, we did have a crime problem. And there was a need to address that uh, from a public welfare standpoint. Uh, so the, the problem is we, we addressed it. and. Uh, what happened was the, the crime rate uh, essentially started going down in the mid peaked and then started going down in the by the mid 90s. And about that same time, uh, drug usage uh, started going down. And it's continued to go down both those things over the next 20 years. Uh, but what happened was uh, instead of sort of recognizing that, we doubled down on the war on crime and the war on drugs. And what you saw was, the, somewhat ironically, the harsher sentencing laws, like you mentioned the Rockefeller sentencing laws, uh, came into play and came in the, the mid-90s to the latter part of the 90s. So you see things like mandatory minimum sentences, eliminating uh, indeterminate sentences, so really taking away the discretion of judges to factor in whether or not there was uh, a weapon used in a crime, or whether there was a person that had a history of violence, what their particular situation was in terms of whether they had were suffering from an addiction or a mental health problem. And and so the, their hands were tied. Uh, you got other uh, laws, like three strikes, you're out, which a lot of people don't realize that 
um, you can have one incident in which you're charged with three crimes, oh. one incident, and those are your three strikes. Mm -hmm. So what you saw were, were Republicans and Democrats alike, uh, in an effort to be tough on crime and get elected, uh, doubling down on these harsh sentencing laws. Um, at a period of time, again, where the, the incident of, of, of crime rates and drug usage was on the decline. So, for example, in the 1990s, uh, we actually built a new prison every two weeks in this country. And, and, and so we were like the Energizer Bunny. We just kept going and going and going without really stepping back and looking as to whether or not the problem had been um, solved. And so we're now uh, looking at the, the fifth decade of war on crime. And one of the points we make in the book is that the mission has largely been accomplished. Uh, in Connecticut, we're currently the safest we've been in 44 years. You have to go back to 1970 to see a, a comparable crime rate. Um, now you could say, well, this is all because we got tough on crime, and, and you know that that was true initially. We, we focused on violent criminals, got them off the streets incarcerated them, but what you did is you, you got to a point where there was a diminishing return on that investment. And so in the 90s, what you saw was the, the, these huge increases that you mentioned in your introduction were largely a matter of incarcerating nonviolent drug offenders. So during the 90s, 80% of the rest were for marijuana possession. You bring up a good point. I'd like to ask John. Um, John, you serve on the Sentencing Commission, is that right? Yes, I do. Julia. Can you tell us about um, about how you were impacted by these, by the, how the sentencing process and commission is affected by these laws that uh, Brian was just discussing? Well, our, our Sentencing Commission here in Connecticut is relatively new. We're only a couple of years old. And we are, <clears throat> even as we speak, working on <clears throat> Uh, our approach to certain things, our approach to what we're going to do with regard to uh, uh, whether we're going to be a research group or an advocacy group for criminal justice reform. Certainly we are doing the research, but the question is, will we just remain at that or not? We have, in the past two years, uh, twice advocated a, uh, a change in, uh, uh, in sentencing for juveniles. As you may or may not know, juveniles can be sentenced very long sentence, sentences, up to and including life in prison. And by the way, there's only one other nation in the world that can sentence a juvenile to life in prison, and that is Somalia. <laughs> so I think maybe we want to think about that. Why, why is that our company, eh? <laughs> Nevertheless, this bill, the essence of which is that if a juvenile is sentenced to a long sentence, after they have served a substantial portion of that, they, are, they deserve a review of that sentence to see if they have been corrected, grown, moved on, and, and, and are, are worthy again of being among society. Uh, this is not to dismiss heinous crimes that can be done by juveniles, that's fine. But our U.S. Federal Supreme Court has already voted twice in the Graham case and the Collins case to do this on a federal basis. So we really ought to do it on a state basis too. So those are the kind of things we've been advocating. Mm -hmm. And uh, and are you then following the bills in the legislature with regard to oh yes, these things? You definitely are. And definitely. is there a, can you give us a website that uh, people, if they're interested, can help follow those bills? Yes. These people in particular are interested in following bills, but many, many others are as well. Fine. We're, so we're, if we're, you provide that to us, uh, we'll make sure we, we add that, that to that this. For you. Um, as a subscript to this program. I, I want to tie together your two questions. One you asked Brian and one you asked me. And uh, to s share with you an anecdote, this past summer, Connecticut hosted the, the uh, United States uh, uh, Convention of All, of all uh, Sentencing Commissions. There are 17 okay. states that have them. We had the Yale Law School back in August. There was a woman there who was from the Federal Sentencing Commission. And she was sharing with us that she was doing some research on sentencing policy back in the early 1980s. And she said that the, the very implicit uh, component of sentencing policy, prudent sentencing policy back in the early 80s was that 
prisoners were irredeemable. That, that they weren't going to get any better. That there was no redemption. There wasn't any point in, in working with them. Now, I mean, any of us whose IQ exceeds a hat size knows that that's probably not the way it should work, number one. Number two, for some reason, call me crazy, we call these institutions that handle these people in our society the departments of correction. Well, I don't think it's unreasonable for we as taxpayers and voters to expect that the Department of Correction will be correcting. And yet, that sentencing policy, and that's it's true in our, in, our, in, our, in our society in Connecticut as well, is, is there. It's there, alive and well. And that's why we need the legal women voters, we need citizens in Connecticut to become informed and educated, become aware, and understand there's a better way to do this. Mm -hmm. And, and let me just type together two other things that, that from your question with Brian. Remember that in the 1980s, as we brought on all those harsh sentencing laws, we simultaneously closed mental institution after mental institution after mental institution. You're absolutely right. And nine in ten people in prison are either mentally ill and or addicted. So one of our goals long run, long run, is that the things that we call prisons today will be now places where we treat people for mental illness and addiction. Then we're going to really go someplace. And I would like to tie in, I can't remember which of you said it, but the, the violent population has gone down. How, how, what percentage of our prison population is considered the violent prisoners versus the percentage of people who are in for drug and other uh, offenses that are not considered violent. Sure. Uh, you know, I would, I would suggest, and there's not real hard data on this, but you, you see different statistics. I think it allows you to say that certainly the clear majority of, of prisoners currently in our system are, would be considered nonviolent. Uh, that the violent population, you know, would be somewhere, it might be a third, people who third to 40 percent of people who have had a history of violence, who've used weapons and, and crimes. So, um, so for example, uh, there's statistics from 2012, federal statistics on drug arrests in the state of Connecticut that indicate that uh, weapons used in only 10 percent of their, their drug arrests. And there's a history of violence in about, uh, I think the range is 10 to 25 percent cases. Um, so, the flip side of that is as many as 70% of drug arrests are for people who didn't use a weapon and or don't have a history of violence. So the question becomes, you know, do you really want to incarcerate those people, uh, one, at the cost in Connecticut, which is a per bed, is $51,000 a, $51, a year per bed. So. Um, and the College overall, education at Harvard is well. Yes, sir. It is. Now, the, the alternative to that is to divert them from prison, get them in a treatment program, um, the cost of which is estimated to be about 10% for what it is to... So about... What would that be then? Well... I mean, 5,000? Uh, uh, for the year? For a well, well, treatment? You, if, the, if the program was over a year. Um, so it's significantly lower cost, sure. yielding better results. Uh, because once you get in the system and you're in prison, um, it's not a good path towards no. not only correction, but it's a, it's a particularly younger prisoner. It's an they, education. You're learning system. from people that you exactly. don't necessarily want to put in front of exactly. a young me, people. Me, Judy, I, I yeah. think we should make a point clear to you that uh, Malta Justice, Brian and I, we are not anti-prisons. Prisons fulfill an important role in society. They always have, do now, always will. There's some people who just are not really fit or capable of being in a free society for diverse reasons. That's not, that's agreed 100%. Our issue is with hyper-incarceration. Our issue is with incarcerating people that don't need it, that in other countries and other jurisdictions don't get it, they don't go there. Western nations, we are so far off the charts of any other Western nation, and incarceration for 100,000 people, 
We're, we're nine times out of Germany, just as an example. They don't do what we do. They treat people for their either mental illness or addiction services. So, uh, well, let me ask you this question. You hear a great deal about the development of private prisons. And do we have private prisons in Connecticut? And no. is that a function of state? No. No. We, ne we never have. Back when we peaked out at 20,000, we shipped some people out to other states. And I don't know if those are private prisons or not, but. No, we don't. We don't do any private prisons here in Connecticut. Well, I'm glad to hear that because yes. that seems to be an economic driver for incarceration. <clears throat> well, it is, but I think public prisons are drivers as well. I and mean, there are certain sections of our state that are inordinately prison-oriented, and uh, they become uh, part of. Uh, here's something. Here, here's, a, here's a new phrase for your your community college: the prison industrial complex. <laughs> It becomes beneficial to have people in prison. It becomes valuable to have people in prison. One in eight people work in the state of Connecticut, work for the Department of Correction. One, one in eight. Employee. One yes. in eight. Yes. One yes. in eight public employees. So the largest employer in the state of Connecticut is the state of Connecticut, and the largest employer among the state of Connecticut is the Department of Correction. That's so that's why we're here to see you tonight. That's, that's why your members need to know about this. And by the way, we're not anti-prison guards either. They're human beings. They're doing a tough job. God bless their hearts for doing it. It's very, very hard to do. I think there's better ways we can employ them. There's better things they can do for us and for them and for our state. Right. And when we talk about uh, uh, DOC personnel, uh, Department of Corrections, Department of Corrections. Um, you know, we, we had people on our editorial board who were uh, former wardens who had worked with the DOC. We reached out at different points in time uh, during the writing of the book to get support materials and statistics from the DOC. They were extremely cooperative. Everyone we've dealt with has been very supportive. The, uh, in, our, in my experience, they're dedicated people. They, most of them have the inmates' interest at heart. Uh, we're not trying to pick a battle with the DOC. We've, we've made specific recommendations. Um, we have advocated a hiring freeze, uh, but at the same time, we, we've advocated that a certain portion of the savings from our reforms should be go towards uh, funding the underfunded pension plan. We've advocated an early retirement program. We've advocated retraining of DOC personnel so they get to be more uh, caseworkers, probation officers, parole officers. This has been done in other states. Uh, Michigan is one state that's, that's implemented the kinds of reforms we're talking about, where they retrain 3,200 corrections personnel uh, to become caseworkers and to work at treating uh, inmates, preparing them for the outs life on the outside. And what you see in those states are testimonials from corrections officers um, saying, you know, that they they value. Uh, achieving the kind of results that they've seen in those states where they've actually seen inmates get restored to society, have a role in society, they take pride in it. Uh, this isn't just about you know, cutting up the budget, cutting up corrections personnel. There's a way, there's a win-win in all this, we think. Um, we think there's something that's legislation that we propose that, that's in there for everybody. Whether you're a conservative or a liberal, from a conservative standpoint, we're talking about saving significant monies and reducing the crime rate because if you drive recidivism down, there's a direct correlation to that and improve public safety. And while we're as safe as we've been as a state since 1970, there's no reason we can't get safer. Uh, safer. We can't yeah. get to where the 1950s were. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Um, so and then uh, so it's a when you say it's a you said earlier it's a no-brainer. We actually think this is a no-brainer. There are very few issues when you look around now where you can see areas of agreement between the extreme left and the extreme right. This is one of those areas. So we should be making progress then, if that's the case. We, we should be. You, you, you can count uh, Rand Paul, Jeb Bush, George Will, Grover Norquist, of all people, in favor of prison reform uh, on, the, on the extreme right. Uh, they see the value in... Uh, being more efficient, giving the taxpayer 
a better payback for their tax dollar, mm -hmm. bringing the cost down and improving the crime rates. Uh, it's a matter, of, as John mentioned, it's not about being soft on crime. It's about being smart on crime. Mm -hmm. Now, you both have talked about recidivism. Is that it right? Recidivism. Yeah, you got it. And the satisfaction. But what that I call that is the revolving door. Do okay. you have a revolving and door system, or do you have a system where you're actually returning people to society? Uh, why are some of the tactics that are used in successful systems to reduce that revolving door. Sure, and, and there are states that have, have done this. Uh, what what they've done is they've taken, they, they get a uh, fender in. And they get what? An offender. Oh, my fender. I'm thinking fender, car. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> sure. Guitar. I don't no. know. So, uh, you get somebody that comes into the system. Okay. Then what they'll do is uh, an analysis of the um, prisoner's needs. Their, their history, what problems they have from a, uh, it's a drug addiction or mental health problem, uh, and I'll actually attempt to address that in the prison and treat that prisoner. Uh, while they're in prison, they'll come up with a transition plan for restoring that person to society. It may involve education. It may involve vocational training. It may involve uh, life skills. The whole, with the whole idea that when you release that person, you're both treating them while they're in the system, and after they're released, you're providing support, a support system around them to try to enhance the likelihood of their succeeding on the outside. And in Connecticut, as John said, two out of every three prisoners who are released end up back in the system within three years. And you, you couple that with the fact that of the prison population, 95% are eventually released. So, uh, in Connecticut's recidivism rate, two out of every three, <coughs> is about over 20 percentage points above the national average. The national average is 43 percent. So, Connecticut is not getting the job done um, in this particular area. Whereas other states that have implemented the kinds of reforms that is diverting people uh, away from prison who can be treated particularly nonviolent drug effects, and then having a plan when they get in the system for restoring them to society, supporting them when they get out. They've seen dramatic drops in recidivism, and with that, reduced costs and, and lower crime. And lowering the crime rate. It's, uh, Interesting. Yeah, because you don't usually think of it that way. But that's, a, I'm beginning to understand what okay. you're saying. Well, let me ask you, we talked about the high percentage of minority folks in prisons. Um, how much has racism and poverty been a part of that incredible percentage? Uh, John, you, you've had some experience within the prison, and um, obviously you've been working on this, and it's your baby. You've built it. Well, uh, Judy, it's uh, it's it's the kind of situation where the, the the deck is kind of stacked against poor people of color in this particular instance. Let's take uh, drug use. The incidence of drug use on a percentage per capita basis in the white community and the black community is the same. It's exactly the same. However, the percentage of people arrested for and incarcerated for drug use is inordinately black or Latino. One thing. Secondly, we happen to have a very fine uh, public defender's office here in Connecticut, headed by Susan Story, who's one of our one of our authors of our book, one of whom doing a great job. But they do not have the time to dedicate to this, these cases that they otherwise might for these poor people who need public defenders. So therefore, they don't get the kind of of, uh, of public defense or, or legal defense that children of other or young people of other uh, of, of suburban uh, more more middle and upper class suburban areas might get. So so there's an inordinate focus on the black community and the Hispanic community and their and their their drug use and the like. There's a lack of ability for this uh, their, uh, legal support. So, and then, and then there's a question of money. I mean, if you get arrested <clears throat> and uh, a, a, bail, a bond is set, if you get put that bond, 
you'll stay in jail until your court comes, your case comes up in court. So we often find people, poor people of whatever ethnic group or color they are, spending time in prison that they wouldn't have to spend if they had a few hundred bucks to afford a bond to get out of prison. <clears throat> but they're in prison. And you and all the nice people living with voters are paying for that. You're paying for that. That's not good. So that's how it happens. And you know, and it's unfortunate. You know, they, they have certain other ethnic issues and the like. And by the way, a lot of times people just lack <clears throat> what a term I heard a number of years ago called, uh, called cultural capital. You take a poor kid in the ghetto. He doesn't have an uncle who's a college teacher. He doesn't have an aunt who runs a store. He doesn't have a sister who's graduating from college. He doesn't have he doesn't have the role models of the people. He doesn't have the education. You know, we, we've got an unfortunate situation where our inner city schools are, are failure factories, and we now have basically a prison, a, a school to prison pipeline, where instead of having the old, uh, you know, having to go to the principal's office, this and that, if you misbehave and whatnot. Now we have a cop, maybe a couple of cops in school. And so therefore, you won't go to the dean of discipline, you'll go to the cop. And the cop maybe will file a charge against you, and, and, and off we go, and here we go. Well, here's the other question, though. How much of that is, how much of, of the picking up on the kids that are kids of color rather than the white suburban kids is racial profiling and undercurrent of racism? Well, I think that's there, without doubt. Uh, it, it can be quantified. I'm, I mean, I've got the thing here. I'll, I'll pull it out in just a minute. But it's, 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 if I remember this right, one in 99 adult Americans is in prison. How do you like that? All right? One in 33 blacks are in prison. If you're black and you're a high school dropout, it's one in seven. You will more likely go to prison than you'll go to college. So th that's kind of the, this is way it goes. Is that racism? I, I, I'm, I'm not sure we're going to go off and fight that battle right now because we've got a number of other ones here. Well, and it may not be within the initiative that you're working Thank on, you. but for me, it, it just seems that there's this undercurrent uh -huh. of assumptions about people. Well, it's not, and it's not just the money for the bail, but there's a whole subset of assumptions. Remember what Brian people. told you, what got him here tonight? He read the new Jim Crow on the show. That's true. That's it's right. true. It's true. Read the book. Judy, think about this. Contemplate this with your colleagues. Today, we have more black people in prison than we had in slavery in 1850. <clears throat> I know the population of America changed. I understand all that. But I'm talking about an order of magnitude issue. More people in prison today than we had in slavery in 1850. So is Jim Crow alive and well? Uh-huh. I think we better read that book, too. <laughs> I think we better. I think we better. Well, let me, uh, let me talk about money a little bit. Um, you got some? We need some money. Yeah, exactly. Send us, so send us a check if you like. So we need money. Um, These books cost money. Another, you. Uh, another question. Oh, I know what it is. It's uh, the the prison populations are included in census counts, which I did not know. Mm -hmm. And uh, we wonder if that is affecting the num their number of congressional representatives and help explain mm -hmm. how towns are competing mm -hmm. to house such institutions. Now, we're not doing that in Connecticut, but are you, do you have any whoa, information whoa, whoa. about Wait, that? What, are, what yeah. aren't we doing in Connecticut? <laughs> well, we're not building private prisons. We're not doing that, but that stuff, the, the things you're mentioning about voter counts. Right. Right. So how do you think that's that's affecting uh, our legislation? Yeah, you know, you'd like to think that it has a lot of fact, particularly, I mean, here we are, uh, Martin Luther King Day, and you're raising an issue which brings to mind the, uh, the three-fifths compromise at the Constitutional Convention in the late 1700s, which was uh, the North allowing the South to count slaves as three-fifths of a person 
for purposes of representation. Um, and then, of course, you know, post uh, Civil War, Jim Crow efforts to prevent votes, blacks from voting, but counting them for purposes of, of uh, the census and, and getting represented. Yeah. So uh, you like to think that that's not part of anybody's thinking these days. It may be a political reality, but I, I'd, I'd like to give people the benefit of the doubt that they're not that uh, uh, account. <laughs> Judy, we, we'd like to invite the League of Women Voters to uh, join us in common cause to investigate and look into that. Because I do believe that that exists here in Connecticut, that there's that kind of thing going on. And, you know, I mean, I, I mean we, 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 we have a lot of dedicated people in our General Assembly, hardworking people, and we respect them all. They're volunteers just as well. They're not quite volunteers. They get paid. We don't get paid. But they're volunteers. But nevertheless, uh, we, you might want to take a look at that. You might want to see what that's all about. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll take that to the uh, yeah. discussion. Um, are there uh, parallels of conditions among the states? I mean, who are, who are we as Connecticut more like than not alike in terms of, uh, of, uh, of reform, of well. correctional reform? So are the is there is it regional? Are we similar to the states in New England in the way we? Well, uh, we are. There's nine northeastern states that have kind of looked at it as a group, and and some of the statistics are you can compare statistics around those groups. For example, Connecticut is the I think of those nine states the um, second or third safest, but has the second or third highest incarceration rate. And again, you might think you know. Well, because we're tough on crime, we're, we have lower safety, but it's actually not not the case because, again, we're so far above on um, recidivism rates. And when you look at New York, for example, what they've done is, uh, New York City is a good example, they have uh, brought down their prison population under Mayor Bloomberg by 33%. Really? And major felonies during that same period of time fell 32%. So New York has... has well, it started with the Rockefeller sentencing laws. They've gone now in the other direction, and they've initiated a lot of the reforms that we've talked about. Uh, so New York City's murder statistics are kind of an interesting benchmark. So if you look at those, in 1965, there were 634 murders in New York. Uh, in 1973, now we get to the four, getting approaching that most violent year that I talked about, it was up to 1,680 murders. In 1990, it peaked at 2,245 murders. In 2013, they reached a record low of 335 murders oh in New York City. And in 2004, it was down another 4.7%. <laughs> so you can reduce the prison population and drive crime rates lower. Uh, but when you talk about states, what you've seen in the states that have made these kinds of reforms You've got red states, you've got blue states. You've got Texas, you've got Michigan, you've got Oregon. Uh, so uh, let's take a red state. Uh, Texas, um, they built 30 new prisons in the 1990s. Um, at one point uh, in the early 2000s, they were looking at spending another $2 billion for three new prisons. They decided uh, to call time out and consider whether this really made sense. So instead of building those new three prisons, they invested $241 million in treatment programs and expanded probation, the kinds of things we've been talking about, diverting people from prison, trying to treat them outside in their communities under supervision. Uh, as a result of which, uh, crime rates fell. Uh, they ended up closing three prisons, and they saved uh, billions of dollars in the process. Uh, Michigan, a blue state. Uh, they were able to reduce their prison population by 12%. They cut recidivism from 50% down to 33%. They closed 21 facilities. Uh, they cut costs by 12%. It's said that they are now saving $300 million a year as a consequence of their reforms. Uh, Oregon brought their recidivism rate down to 22.8%. That's the lowest in the country, but it shows you what's possible. So it's clearly possible for Connecticut to go from two of every three 
returning through the revolving door to one in three or even lower. And if you succeed in doing that, you're going to see taxpayers going to realize benefit in terms of reduced costs. You're going to see reduced crime rates. Uh, you're going to give mothers and fathers back to their families, mothers and fathers back to their communities. You're going to give these people a chance at redemption, becoming a taxpayer themselves, a, be a member of their church, a member of their community. Uh, but if you don't take this kind of holistic approach to both treating them and giving them a shot when they get out of prison, at a job, uh, and that's a real challenge, trying to get them um, re-employed. And we've got some specific recommendations to try to help that along. But that's, um, and Governor Malloy la uh, announced last week a, a, what he calls a second chance or second opportunity program, designed again at trying to get ex-offenders into jobs. Do you want to uh, tell us what some of your hopes are specifically for changes in this in, in the state and through legislation? Maybe John wants well, to start with that. Specifically, Judy, it begins with you and your colleagues and living with the voters. This is about. Well, we also need to talk about our wider community, not do. just the league. Well, it's all well, the people who are watching. The thing is that, that what I know about your fine organization is that you are a catalyst. You are, you are an information source and a catalyst that many of us look toward to see what are the what are the appropriate and meaningful and important political topics for us to be contemplating. So you're 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 a guide to all of us, and we appreciate that very much. The fact of the matter is that, that there's a there's a three phase thing here of awareness, motivation, and action that we need on the part of the Connecticut citizen in regard to this issue. Awareness, you can build it right here, very simply, very easily. This is only one way, this happens to be the best way, but there's other ways to do it as well. Just start listening and watching about, about matters with regard to criminal justice, criminal justice reform. You will be motivated if you read that. And we need people to take the action to call, write, email, connect to, see, say, to state legislators, to state reps and, and senators. Senator, I read the justice imperative. I heard there's a better way to do uh, to do reentry to into society. What are you doing about that, Senator? I heard that there's a, I heard that if we had you know, we're investing more money in mental health treatment and drug addiction treatment, that we could uh, increase public safety, Representative. What are you doing about that? So that's that's the kind of help that we need. That's the things people can do. And be very simple to do it. At, at the end of our show tonight, you'll see a place where you can, where you can get, send us your email address. We won't sell it to anybody. We'll be very, very careful with it, but we'll keep you informed. I mean, right now, right now, as we speak, there are three bills being proposed for this session. And they, ha and they have essentially the same uh, thought pattern behind them. They are to... Uh, uh, eliminate the ability of convicted felons, those are people coming back, from getting uh, food stamps. Well, excuse me, excuse me. If you've been to prison and you've paid your time and you've done your thing and you're out now, and maybe you can't get a job as you're a felon, now you want to say, I can't get food stamps either? Talk excuse about me. that revolving door. Talk There's about the revolving door. So. Therefore, when we, we will give, if we have your email address, we'll keep you informed of the progress of those bills because that doesn't make a lot of sense. I'm sure that some of you think that's a good way to punish people who, who misbehave, that's fine. But we, you know, we have to discern between people that we are afraid of and people that we're mad at. Pathological uh, peer persons we're afraid of, and they need incarceration. People we're mad at. We have to make them a taxpayers. When they be, when, when a felon becomes a taxpayer, everybody wins. They don't become a taxpayer, we all lose. Okay. So what was the uh, you said awareness action? Awareness what was motivation. Your third word? Awareness oh, motivation. motivation. Awareness motivation action. Right? Okay, sorry, you become aware. That. You'll be motivated. Then take the action. Okay. And it's easy. It's easy. Very good. Call, email, write, connect to. 
Sure. And watch your screen, and we'll have the yes, we will. Uh, we'll have the contact information on the Absolutely, screen. Absolutely, yeah. So that's great. Um, I guess the one other question I really would like you to talk about briefly. We only have a few minutes, but um, what about the emphasis of education of children in uh, in poor geographic areas? to avoid that initial misstep. Is there anything in the project that you've worked on that you might give a little well, insight? We've, um, we've, we've thought about it in this one sense. Um, you know, this is a problem as to which there's a clear, I think, solution uh, that can satisfy both the extreme left and the extreme right and everybody in the middle. The problem of minority academic achievement gap is perhaps the most daunting problem that I think Connecticut faces. And we've thrown a lot of money at it. We don't seem to make much of a dent in it. It's really tough. But if you take a holistic view of this, to the extent that you reduce the prison population and this pipeline from school to prison and you put a dent in that, you, it's going to have residual impact in other areas. It'll help break to a certain extent, this cycle of dependence, cycle of poverty, and I think the cycle of minority academic underachievement. Uh, the one specific sort of concrete proposal we make is with respect to reentry and trying to help uh, felons get jobs. One of the things we've advocated, pointing to a very successful program in California, where they teach inmates to be programmers, to write code. Mm -hmm. They've had great success with that. They're very capable of learning code. Uh, and they're able to put them in jobs. We advocate the same thing here in Connecticut. To try to have the vocational training that's done in the prisons be really savvy in terms of looking at what markets mm -hmm. are out there and where there's a demand for workers. One of the proposals we make is to do that, get them really computer literate, and then try to place them in jobs. But if we don't get them in a job, then we propose something called the Community Corps, similar to the Peace Corps, that would allow them when they get out of prison to, to at least contribute to their communities by providing training that could augment early childhood education Head Start programs. They'd have to be supervised, obviously, but they could be a resource to those programs to teach kids to become computer literate. It would help those programs, but more importantly, it would give those uh, people released from prison a purpose in life, uh, a sense of self-worth, an opportunity to give back to their communities and to realize the kind of redemption that, you know, hopefully, we, we talk about that as being the holy grail of corrections. We, when we talk about our reforms, we, we talk about it being, a, I guess I go to too many horse races, but uh, a <laughs> trifecta, uh, lower costs, increased public safety, lower recidivism, and then you get a superfecta, which is if you get all four winners in the race, one, two, three, four. <laughs> and the, the, the superfecta is you actually restore somebody back to their family and their community mm -hmm. and have somebody giving them a second chance in life. Judy, three quick points on this education thing. Understand that our criminal justice issues and problems are centered and grow in poverty and ignorance. That is the very fertile ground that grows this problem, poverty and ignorance. Number two, in Connecticut, we are unique among all 50 states in the Union. We have the largest achievement gap Okay. of any of the 50 states. Absolutely there's something true. that's not good situation. Number three, there's hope. Two wonderful universities, and we have a number of them in the state, Wesleyan and Trinity, are teaching college courses in prison. Now, very simple maxim. Mm -hmm. When a person in prison gets smart, they get smart. Mm -hmm. They stop doing the silly, stupid things that put them in prison, and they get smart, and they become more likely the taxpayers that we want and need them to be as far as possible. Restore them to their life. They have a life again. They become human beings again. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, in our mad dash to punish people back in the 90s, we decided no more Pell Grants for people in prison. Nothing. We're not going to educate them. Put them in prison. They've been bad. They've been bad. We have put them in prison for a long time. The payback on educating people in prison is approximately six to one. For every dollar invested in educating someone in prison, the return is six dollars on reduced cost of recidivism. So 
Is education connected to this? You bet your boots it is. It's a big, big part of it. And the more the more proactive we all are in that regard, the better it's going to be for all of us. And just to reinforce that point, there's a, a college education program that's run by Mercy College at Sing Sing Prison in Boston, New York. They call it the University of Sing Sing. They've operated it over a 16-year period. The recidivism rate for graduates of that program is 2%. Two. It, it can work. Versus 66. Right. Two. Well, this has been extremely interesting and eye-opening. Uh, I encourage everyone who is watching this program on YouTube or on public access or some other way to become more educated, to um, read the book, uh, or just become involved. Watch the legislation. Talk to legislators about uh, what are they doing. And um, we thank you all for, for coming, for watching. We thank our guests so much for being here today. Again, it's the justice imperative, how hyper-incarceration has hijacked the American dream. Thank you both so much. Well, thank, thank you, you for, for having us. We really appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks for inviting us. Real pleasure. Thank you very much. My name is Gaston Downey, and I'm a member of the League of Women Voters. There are several reasons I, why I belong to this organization. First, I strongly believe that one of the most important functions of a citizen is to vote. The, this organization makes a big effort registering voters. Second, I also believe that an informed electorate is very important, and the League of Women Voters brings speakers to inform voters on important issues that are being considered for a vote. Third, this organization is a nonpartisan advocacy group lobbying legislators on pertinent issues of concern to the community. Finally, I enjoy the company of women. My lawyer is a woman, my doctor is a woman, my financial advisor is a woman, and my best friend, who sometimes plays the role of my wife, is also a woman. I would like to encourage other men to join this worthwhile civic organization.